You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello, welcome to a second Garibaldi Red of the week. We're back 24 hours after yesterday's episode because it was a dramatic 24 hours around Nottingham Forest. Further news around Steve Cooper's future and then uh, later reporting about Dane Murphy and uh, recruitment staff potentially leaving the city ground. Eventually nothing happened, but it does leave a cloud of uncertainty over the club. So we're going to discuss that with Darren Fletcher. Fletcher, you were at the King Power on Monday. You were at Anfield yesterday. You're looking very fresh. How are you feeling? <laughs> I'm okay. Stanford Bridge tonight. Um, bearing up in the circumstances. Yeah, I was. I, I, I went um, I went as a fan on, on Monday night and I was in the away end. And before we get into anything negative or unsavoury or whatever, I have to say, the performance of the Forest supporters on Monday night was astonishing. I don't get the chance to travel away from home very often due to work commitments, but the atmosphere was unbelievable. And when they burst into song in the second half at 3-0 down and sang constantly for what felt like an hour um, to try and get behind the team was unbelievable. Um, And it was was special and it kind of kind of shows that connection between the city and the team and, and the fans and the players and the manager and what have you. And I, I didn't think there were many clubs in the Premier League in the circumstances that Forrest are in right now that would have done it. And the other thing that kind of popped into my mind while I was there, you always kind of listen with a with a journalistic ear, with a reporter's ear. And I didn't hear in my earshot, so I can't say, bearing in mind there were thousands there that I heard what everybody was saying, but I didn't hear any dissenting voices towards the manager. Yes, I heard some criticism of certain individuals and the overall team performance on the night. But in terms of the fan base and, and what they think about the manager right now, it didn't seem to me as though it had changed a great deal from Wembley last season. I think there's like a general acceptance the performance was abject. I don't know if you disagree with that, but what's your take on the manager's situation then? Because that's the big talking point coming out of it. Look, I, I think... Anybody who watches football and knows the landscape of, of, of the Premier League in particular, any time you lose five games in a row, you're under pressure. I mean, normally it's four, isn't it? Any manager that loses four games in a row, you're under pressure. So Steve's lost five. So, of course, you then start to assess situations, discussions start to be had, various names start to get linked with clubs. And, of course, that individual is under pressure. I think we've got slightly unique circumstances here as well because Steve has an expiring contract. And there's been a lot of talk over the course of the summer as to whether a new one had been agreed in principle and why it's not being signed. So it's not as if Steve Cooper has long-term security at Nottingham Forest because he's got a contract that's going to expire in the not-too-distant future. I think this, the circumstances that he finds himself in right now are unique for anybody. And I said very early in, 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 in the season, maybe before a ball had even been kicked, the 17th would be enough for Forrest this season. I know there were lofty expectations in the summer about where they could finish based on the recruitment, which I'm sure we're going to get into as the podcast goes on. But in terms of what they need to do this season, they need to finish 17th. And that still is um, something that they can aim at based on the league position they find themselves in. My own personal opinion, and that's all that this can be at this stage, because I don't know what's being said behind closed doors at the city ground, where I've got no doubt there are, meetings happening all the time about the situation they're in, some negative, some positive, because people in there want to try and sort the situation out as quick as they can, one way or the other. But I think a lot of people made the point over the course of the summer that the one thing Forrest needed now in the first season back was stability. I don't think you can start to get to this stage of a season and say, well, let's change the manager. My challenge to people who want the managerial change would be, A, what are the alternatives? And the list I've seen, I would describe as relatively uninspiring in terms of what you could potentially get. Um, the second thing is, I would say, has the manager lost the dressing room? Well, I think that's difficult because he's only just had the dressing room. There's only a very small group still in there from last season. So this is a get to know each other process for everybody. And then I would also say, has he become a worse manager than he was last season and does the skill set that he has, is that skill set now not what Forrest need? Now, my understanding of Steve is that he's a very good people person. He's very good at getting a a dressing room together. When you've got 22 new players, I would suggest that that is something that you need. 
and he's also regarded across football, not just in the city of Nottingham, as a very good coach. And I think that when you have a situation like they have, you need someone who can get a group on a training pitch and work out what the situation is. The unfortunate aspect to all of this is that this takes a significant period of time. And I looked this morning at the way some of the recruitment had gone. Um, and they signed eight of the 22 players after the season had started. So you have a situation here where you're now in a very hectic schedule where you've not got time on the training pitch like you had in the, in the preseason. Eight new players would be an entire summer for the majority of clubs. This is eight out of 22 who came after they'd started against Newcastle. So that just magnifies the problem. It just exacerbates the issue. And I think the only way that Forrest are going to sort this out is to give it time to develop. And I don't think you can rush it. I read yesterday that Rafa Benitez was, was being linked with the job. Great. Rafa's an organiser, won a Champions League at Liverpool, won a La Liga title with Valencia, managed to keep Newcastle in the Premier League with a pretty bang average group of players. But he also went to Everton last season and was run out of the club very early because he, he didn't have the impact that he had before. So Rafa's an organiser. Maybe you can put Forrest in a position where they don't concede goals with the regularity that they did. But I think ultimately, when you look at what they need as a group at the minute, even though results haven't been good, I think a managerial change at this time would be the wrong decision. Is there a bigger question? And Maybe this is like me being too much of a doe-eyed romantic, but is there a bigger question around the bond with the football club and the feeling that we've had in the last year that would realistically be lost if you get rid of Cooper and bring in uh, Benitez, less so to a Dyche because he's got not seen connections, or other Bruno Large and Nuno Dos Santos have been mentioned. Um, do we have to be a bit more hard nosed than that, or do you have to give Cooper a bit more of an allowance because what he can potentially do in the long term? Look, I think that when somebody's a nice guy, and Steve Cooper is a genuinely nice guy, he always gets cut a little bit more slack from people that have been in contact with him. And the vast majority of Forest fans have been in contact with him because he's a very accessible person and he'll always stop and speak to supporters and all that kind of thing. So you have more sympathy with a man in a situation like that. But this is the cold, hard reality of Premier League football. So things like that have to be forgotten about to a large extent. Um, but what I would say is that Steve only got that connection because he won games. If Steve would have come in last season and Forrest would have finished six bottom, the football was up and down. He wouldn't have had the relationship that he has with the supporters now. The entire club and the city, the fan base, the players, the manager, all got carried along on that magic carpet ride and it led to a very special relationship. But I think that does count for a lot. I think this is the most connected that I've known the city and the fan base with the club for quite some time. And I think that shouldn't be underestimated. And you go back to the days of Brian Clough and, and, and not everybody can remember that. And I'm an, I, I might be an old stager, so I can. But there was a real connection between manager, between City. Everybody knew who the manager was. It was his club. And it did count for a lot. And I think sometimes you can underestimate the relationship between manager, club and City. And if you are looking to try and end that relationship too quickly, you can sometimes then spend the next decade or two trying to get it back again. And if you think back to the situation at Forest. In 1993, when Brian retired, Frank Clark, after that, for a three and a half year period, was connected to the city as well. But I think after that, it's pretty difficult to find a manager that's ever had the kind of connection that, that Steve Cooper's had. And I think that, that that has to be a factor in anybody's decision down there. Because, again, when you kind of look at the problem he has, that he's got a mould 22 new signings into what he has still from last season and find some kind of team that can function properly. That is merely a time issue. But if it's a time issue with a manager that people believe in and have time for, then that process becomes easier to accept, I think. And I suppose if you change manager, we said this yesterday, it might work. It's a roll of the dice. You know, you can't say it's definitely the wrong decision because it might come off. But then if you change the manager, you've got 22 new players and new staff and a new manager as well. So that's the kind of the pillar that was holding it all together is basically gone. And you just, in a, just a swirl of uncertainty is a bit dramatic maybe, but you just don't know what you're going to get, do you? No, 
Of course you don't. I mean, I mean, look, look. Manchester United like to describe themselves as the biggest club in the world, and other people are quite happy to describe them that way as well. So they essentially have the pick of of most managers on the planet. I think if you look at the managers that they've employed since Sir Alex Ferguson left, they still haven't found the right one. So if a club like that, with unlimited resources and the ability to attract anybody, is finding it difficult to get the right manager to to actually look after a very, very talented group of players and make them better. Just look how difficult it is for anybody else. You know, if there was a an obvious candidate there, you know, if somebody was sat there and you, and you went absolutely perfect for the job, you know, when Pellegrini was the Manchester City manager and he won a league title and Guardiola sat there, it's easy to say, well, look, now what Pellegrini is a good manager, but Pep Guardiola is better. So Manchester City, make the decision. Let's go and get Pep Guardiola. We'll be a better side, better club. It's easy. But do you look at that list and say they're better managers than the fella that Forrest have now in the circumstances? I don't think too many people would categorically say that anybody at the moment being linked with the Nottingham Forest job is is an absolute definite upgrade on the person that is in there now. And I think that, that kind of answers a lot of questions. If the obvious one is there, fine. Everybody gets it because you know automatically you're getting a, a superior manager who's going to make your club better. If that's not there, you're taking a chance. Yeah. And I, I think too many chances have been taken already. Let's cut to the chase here. I think this is as much about recruitment as it is the manager. I, 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 I can't get my head away from the way that this group's been put together. And the more you see it, the more evident it becomes. Mm. Yeah, and we'll come on. Yeah, I mean, I've said it here, I'm not hindsighting that after you got past maybe the 15th signing for me, there were ones like Bolly that I didn't really understand, Barde, Aurier. It's kind of why are you signing Julian you, you Bianchi? You've used a really good word there, players. Matt. You just use a really good word there. You've used the word hindsight. Mm. Football clubs employ people for hindsight to be foresight. Otherwise, we could all go in and say, look, in hindsight, not the wrong one. Sorry. If I could take 14 back with a receipt, I'd do it. I got it wrong. You pay for people and you put a process in place to where hindsight becomes foresight. That You should know more than anybody else. You should be the brightest one in the room. That's why you're there. Otherwise, you could go into any bar in Nottingham where the supporters are We've all got an opinion on players and say, here's a few quid. Who do you want to put in the team? Well, I'll go for that, 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 that. And then in hindsight, well, I got that wrong. You have a recruitment team to get the decisions right. That's what they're there for. At any football club. And it's all right sticking the manager out there, making the suggestion that he might need to lose his job because they're not winning football matches. But if you look at the group that he's working with, the skill sets that have been put in front of him, I think it's been made even more complicated by the type of player that's come in. So leading on from that is the news yesterday that we reported and lots of other outlets reported about Chief Executive Dane Murphy's, you know, under a lot of scrutiny, George Sirianis, who's the head of recruitment, uh, Andy Scott, who's the head of scouting, who's worked with Steve before at Swansea and managed Brentford. They're all under a lot of scrutiny. What, what's your take on that? I mean, it's a big admission of... Failure after nine games, isn't it? If you of, course move under, of course they're under scrutiny. Of course they're under scrutiny. If you sign 22 footballers for 150 million quid and you look at it and say, well, what are we going to do with the group to get 11 together that play together? Of course there's going to be scrutiny. I, I haven't got an opinion whether any of the, the, the men that you've just spoken about should lose their job, should stay at the club. I don't know them. I've briefly spoken to Dane Murphy. I, I wouldn't know who the other two were if they walked past me in the street. So I, I wouldn't comment on them as individuals. But what I would say is that when you look at the group, Forrest big failing at the minute is stopping goals going in. Now, whether that's a collective or whether that's a defensive issue, I don't know because I'm not a tactician. But I know they signed nine defenders out of the 22 in the summer. 
And they've conceded three against Bournemouth. They've conceded three against Fulham. They've conceded four against Leicester. And it could have been more. And you look at that group and say, last season's defenders are still the ones that you could probably rely on. Would you not agree? Oh, yeah. I, mean, I put an 11 yesterday and I had Warren and McKenna in it still. Right. And I said, so the point is, you, if, if, there's, if there's a question being asked to the recruitment team, if the best centre-back, I mean, look, we don't know what near Cate is going to be. Early signs were he's going to be good. He's the kind of one that fits the Premier League profile in terms of what his skill set is. But we won't really know until he plays a sequence of matches. But he looked like he got a bit of speed, strength. He was OK on the ball. He read it well, a leader. So ticked a lot of boxes. But you look, if you take him out, there are still eight defenders that were signed in the summer. Do, do, does anybody really know whether they're going to be the answer? That's eight mm. defenders. It's not. There's not one that might be wrong or two. This is eight defenders. It's the biggest picture around the football club now. Then around stability and certainty. So you either have to make these changes and quickly and put a whole new structure in place, which creates more instability to me when you've already, um, you know, changed twenty-two players. You've you've got. You've got Dane Murphy there. You've got Mar Mil um, Evangelos Maranakis owning the club. Miltiardis Maranakis has taken on a, a bigger role over the summer and last season, uh, in, you know, uh, around the club. There's a lot of stuff swirling around. You need to make some decisive, dis decisive decisions, obviously, and bring some stability to the football club now. What I'd say, Matt, is that we only get to see a window into a football club. We're not there. Monday to Friday to know what the process is. But there will they will there'll there'll be processes within that football club. And only they know ownership, senior management, whether the processes are being carried out properly, whether they're successful, whether they believe that by following that process it will ultimately make them successful. We we only get to see the product on a Saturday afternoon for, for 90 minutes. It's like walking into a restaurant. The only opinion you have is that the food tastes nice. But you don't know what the kitchen looks like behind the scenes because you don't get to go in. Very similar at a football club. We all pay the money and we go in and we get to see a little 90-minute showcase of what they do. But we don't know what the process is like behind the scenes. So in terms of the way that that, that group operate, I don't know whether people should be sacked or whether it's working right. What I would say is that from an ownership standpoint, I think it's quite refreshing that the owner is actually looking globally at the problem. That he's not just saying, well, let's just sack a manager, bring somebody else in, and then we'll take it from there. He's saying, based on what we heard yesterday, I need to look at the whole process here as to why we're in this situation. Could we have spent the money better? Are the recruitment team coming up with the right answers? Is that in step with what the manager wants? Is the manager happy with what he has? Can the manager then coach the players that, that, that we give him properly? It's not quite root and branch, but it's quite refreshing that, that they're taking an overall view rather than just going into one room and saying, look, Steve Cooper, you've lost some games. Off you go. Let's put somebody else in. They are actually taking a look at it overall to see what they could have done better, what they've done right, what they've done wrong, which I think is quite refreshing, don't you? It's just the timing, isn't it? Like you're nine games in and you've spent 150 million quid and now you're having to not root and branch, as you say, but you're digging into every, well, it is root and branch, really, digging into all the major structures of the club and you're nine games into the Premier League and you're bottom of the league. You're not adrift. There's plenty of time to turn it around, but the timing of all this is is far from ideal, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the timing the timing's terrible, but I made the point right at the top of the conversation. Eight of the players were signed after they played against Newcastle. Mm. So the timing of it has been generated by the way the club have gone about it. Mm. So that's a, you, you, that's you, a difference you, you, with you, football you as well. Your own problem. You made the point earlier. You go into the restaurant and you you don't care about your food, or you care about your food. You don't care how it was prepared or the process behind it. It's a bit well, different. I didn't say you don't does. care. I said you don't get to see it. There's a difference between not not caring and not getting to see it. You don't but get to see it, do you? You can't say. I'll have that steak, but let me go and see the kitchen first. You, you've been told it's a nice restaurant. You expect the food to taste good. And if it does, you don't question it, is the point I'm making. Mm. If Forrest was sat now with 10 points, 
nobody externally would be questioning what the processes are at the club. But ownership might, is the point I'm making. Ownership might be looking, even if they got 10 points instead of four, and saying, but did we get it right? Is that individual doing the right thing? Are, is that process helping? That's the way it works in reality for any successful business. But we only get to see the 90-minute window. That's How's the they point get- that It's only being highlighted now because they can't win. How do they get back to winning? I mean, we're not going to, we like you, we don't see the training, we don't know everything. You just ask me how they get back to winning. If I knew that, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd tell somebody that I've got no idea, no idea no. how they get back to winning. But what I do know is that they're not going to play against Aston Villa on Monday night and look an awful lot different to what they looked like last week until the manager works out what he's going to get from the group. The problem he's got, you can set everything up in training all week. Football clubs do small sided games, big sided games. Work on the work on the plan. Put it all together. If you know players and you know them, and he knew the group last year, he got to know that group over the season. So he knew the ones that he could rely on. He knew the skill sets that they had, and he could, he could put a tactical plan in place. And he would know in general what everybody was going to give him. So he'd know the levels he could go to in terms of. I need you to do this. But he wouldn't say to a player that he knows, I need you to do something that I know you can't do. Now, they've got all these players at the moment, and he's trying to get to know them on the training pitch. But one thing you can never replicate is when the pressure comes in a Premier League match, how do they react? That's when you find out who you can rely on and who you can't. Now, that means you've got to take a few bumps along the way. You've got to lose a few games while you work that out unless you're very lucky and land on it day one. My concern for them at the moment, and this is my own personal view again, is that I think the performance that they gave against Tottenham would have been good enough to beat Leicester on Monday. And I think the performance levels in general have dropped, which which probably is a confidence thing because they're losing matches. But, I mean, look, go back to the recruitment. Look at the midfield. If you go through the midfielders that that Steve has to pick, I would challenge that most of them, if not all of them, are different to the other. So, Oral Mangala is different to Lewis O'Brien. Lewis O'Brien is different to Oral Mangala and Czech Kiate. Remo Freuler is different to all of them. Ryan Yates is different to all of them. So if you take one out, if you want to play Remo Freuler, for argument's sake, and there's been a lot of discussion about whether he should be in the side. Yeah? Yeah. Right. Remo Freuler plays a certain way. Played a certain way for Atalanta, plays a certain way for Switzerland. So the team needs to play the way that Remo Freuler wants to play, really. Or he's got to be able to adapt to what you're doing. But if that's not his strength, you've got a problem. If you play Czech Kiate in there, the team have got to play in a different way again because mm. he's different to Remo Freuler. If you put Lewis O'Brien in, he's different to them. So my, my, my thing is, when you look at teams' recruitment policies, they often identify certain types. So they would say, let's say if you're recruiting for an Antonio Conte team, you know the skill set that an Antonio Conte player needs to have. So the Spurs recruitment team would go away and try and sign players that fit the mould so that when he takes one out, he puts one in. So if Hoybier comes out of Tottenham, Bissouma goes in and the team doesn't change. Because Bissouma's skill set is very similar to Hoybier or Bentoncourt. Would, would you say, I'm asking you, would you say that that's the case here? No, and the problem is, from what you were saying there, you know, okay, if you pick Remo Freuler and you play Remo Freuler's way, Remo Freuler's way might not be Tyro Awanee's way. Right. And you've got to find that balance of like... But the problem is then, Matt, when you take Freuler out, who else at the club can do what he does? Yeah, it's that balance, you know, isn't it? You, you, you've then got to change. So what yeah. I'm saying is, I don't. everybody can look at individual players and say, well, he's good and he's not, and I like that one and I don't like that one. Hmm. 
my my question would be, and it's only a question. My question would be: Did they were they joined up enough in terms of identifying types, so that the team shape and the team idea is consistent? And when you look at last season's team, you could probably not watch it with your eyes closed and know how they were going to play. But you weren't far off that. You knew Keenan Davis was going to do a Keenan Davis job. You knew James Garner was going to get about the pitch and Ryan Yates. And you knew where Joe Spence would be. And we don't have that now. And we can't have that. But you also knew that if he takes Ryan Yates off, he'd replace him with Jack Colback. Same thing. Yeah. If you took Keenan Davis off, you put Sam Surridge on. Same job. Yeah. And we can't know that now. Now, I watched on Monday, Emmanuel Dennis came on for Tyro Awani. Now, you, you couldn't have a more different profile of a footballer. It's an mm. entirely different setup. Mm. Look at the midfield. Look at the midfield that started the match, what, what, what that pair could do, and look at what it looked like in the second half. It was completely different. And mm. it's not just either better or worse. It's different. So mm. I think, again, that extends the time frame that the manager needs whoever he is to solve it mm. if you've got five midfielders who are all relatively similar you're just looking for the best one for your group but if you've got five that are different you've got to work out how that functions best within the within the group in general haven't you so if you were to go to villa and yeah. you play sam sorridge brennan johnson ryan yates joe worrell scott mckenna Steve Cook and have that back three. I mean, that's an admission of a failure recruitment. But Cooper would know what he's going to get from those players. But then similarly, he wouldn't know. He wouldn't be any further along the road to knowing how to get the best out of all these other players they brought no, in. So it's a real no, catch-22. The problem there is, though, he'd know exactly what he's going to get from the players. But does he think that group at Premier League level would would be right, would be good enough? Does he know? He We're still always asking the same questions. Yeah, he's not going to come out and say that publicly, is he? No. But what, what I would say is, if you add to that the group that you've just spoken about, the players that were there last season that were maybe the difference makers, then it's a, a different story. I, look, I just think this is a time thing. And I think the way they've gone about it means it's going to take longer than, it, than anybody thought. Mm. It, it's, just, it's just the way of it. But, but let's not get back from the, from the remit at the start of the season. What's we'll stay up? Mm. They've got a, they've, they've, you know, they've still got a fair chance of staying up, and people have got to remember what they say in August. You've got to carry on into October, and then November, and then December. Football's great at having one opinion one week and then changing it the next because you stick your finger out the window and go with which way the wind's blowing. Seventeenth is what they need to do, and everybody that looked at this logically said you're not going to see the best forest for a few months then by process of elimination, you're probably not going to see the best of Forest until after the, the World Cup. And after the World Cup, there's still 22 matches, I think, for the Premier League season to go. 66 points. Now, I know that as each week passes, the chances of staying up diminish because you need to get points from fewer matches. But this was always likely to be the case. And mm. I think that people got carried away by the recruitment and thought top 10. I heard some people saying they were going to push for the Europa League. I mean, it was absolute madness. Madness. This is the most difficult league in the world. Leicester City have just put four past Forest, having lost six on the bound. But look at the players they've got in the team. Look how Madison played on Monday. My challenge to the Forest group would be, who's going to be James Madison? Mm. Who's going to walk out there against Aston Villa and say, this is my game? Mm. I'm going to dominate on this pitch. This is I'm going to be the one tonight that's going to be the difference for us. I didn't see that on Monday. I saw some timid performances. I thought they passed it backwards and square far too much. If you do that in the Premier League, you can't get out. You've only got a long ball. Somebody's got to go and grab that and think, look, I'm better than this. I'm a better mm. player than this. Mm. Jesse Lingard's got to be better. Morgan Gibbs-White's got to be better. Tyro Owen, he has to score when he's 1v1 at 0-0. It's all right saying, well, uh, you've got to. 
This is the Premier League. You don't get four chances to score. You get one. And I, I would challenge a lot of people. They'd lost six on the spin. If Forrest go 1-0 up at Leicester, how do they respond? Do they then go and rattle four in? I'm not sure. Because they were mentally fragile going in also. What would the crowd have been like if they'd have gone 1-0 down? But you don't take the chance. And by not taking the chance, you cause a problem for yourself. And I think, too, when you go back to recruitment, Matt, they've got one number nine, really. Seems pretty obvious that they don't feel that Sam Surridge is, 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 is a player that they want to start in the Premier League. So you're down to Tyro Awani, and that's it. And there was the mad scramble on deadline day to try and get Michy Batshuayi, who was available all summer. Available all summer. The next day, he goes somewhere else. He's available all summer. No way he's going to play for Chelsea. He'll play for Chelsea for three years. Batshuayi could have come in at any stage. Mm. Yes, I have to hold my hands up on Batshuayi and say I didn't want him. But now with hindsight... Matter, whether, whether anybody wants him or not, they've only got one number nine. Signed 22 players, they've got one number nine. If you yeah, don't that's... play him, you're playing a combination of Gibbs, White, Johnson and Lingard in a rotating three. That, that's, mm. that's difficult. It, it, you're not really seeing that. You're asking Brennan to play out of position. You may be asking Emmanuel Dennis to play out of position because he's happier playing wide. You've got a situation where you've signed all these players. You've got one number nine. And, and look at him. Scored a couple of goals that were the very short distance. But that's a player that scored goals in the Bundesliga but needs refining. Sure, the potential's in there. You can see it. But it needs work. It needs time. Tywo's not going to go out there next next week against Aston Villa and, and, and look like Stan Collymore. It's not happening. Not for a period of time. Might take him the whole of this season, maybe some of next, before you knock off the rough edges and, and start to bring out that potential that he's got. And all of a sudden you round off his game. And then you think, now we've got a player. But at the moment, if he doesn't play, Forrest are essentially playing without a number nine. And that, that, that's a problem in terms of balance. So again, you go back to the recruitment Nine defenders have been signed and they can't stop conceding goals. And they've got one number nine that they think they can rely on. Mm. You can understand why internally those questions are being asked, can't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, my, yeah. My grumble with the team on Monday was around balance again. There's a, Steve's trying to shoehorn Gibbs, White, Lingard and Johnson into the same team and it's not working. Is it foolhardy to bin off Lingard for a few weeks or one of those? Well, he's also tried it without Jesse Lingard, hasn't he? Yeah. He's picked teams as well without Jesse Lingard. So he has actually tried that. I don't think he's averse to trying anything. I don't think he sat he's I don't think he sits there in the morning and thinks, gotta pick that one. I don't think he does. I think if 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 leaving all three of them out got him a win, I think he'd do that. But, but I, I again, he's trying to work out his best eleven whilst playing games. And the confidence is going lower and lower and lower. Every decision he takes impacts that. So it, it's it's a nightmare situation for him. It's all right saying, well, look, sack the manager then, get somebody else in. It's not going to be any easier for the next fellow that walks through the door. He's got to start from scratch. He's got the same patchwork quilt. He's got the same jigsaw puzzle where they just tip the box out on the floor and he's got to put it back together again. At least they're down the, the road with the process. And I know for a fact, I know for a fact he couldn't work any harder than he is. He's there all hours, God sends. He's in there in the morning. He stays till late at night. He then goes home and, and, and does what he does there in terms of, in terms of um, watching the opposition and looking at his own team and trying to work it out. And look, I, I, I don't want to betray confidence, but that's the mark of the fella. I don't know whether ultimately you can keep Forrest in the Premier League or ultimately whether he's the right manager for them. But what I do know is he's working as hard as he can and he's completely committed to what he's trying to do. And, and that counts for a lot. He's here. What? I'm not sure that everybody's here for the right reason. But I know that he is. Mm. You, you, can't tell me that all, you can't tell me that all 22 of those players, Matt, that they signed in the summer are here because they are desperate to be Nottingham Forest players. It's just not the case. It's just not. Any football club, some people are there for different reasons, right? It's not a Forest thing. It's a football thing. Some people are more committed than others. Yeah? 
So you oh, yeah. can't tell me that all 22 are there because they love the badge. They've watched I Believe in Miracles. They think the Forest supporters are brilliant. And their, their one motivation in life is to win football matches for Nottingham Forest. Some are there for different reasons. But I can absolutely guarantee you that the manager is there for every one of those reasons. And that counts for a lot. I can't tell you that the next one coming in would feel that way either, whoever that is. But you know that the one you've got is going to give you absolutely everything while he's there. And I think in a situation like this, that matters. And I think in this city, Matt, that matters. I've lived here all my life. Followed this club all my life. Very fortunate that in my formative years, the man that I think the, is the greatest footballer that English football's ever produced was the manager. And I watched them win European Cups. And I've seen a lot of flyby nights come in past that point. Managers not fit for purpose. Players not fit for purpose. Owners not fit for purpose. And I don't include the current man in, in, in that situation because he's backed this club superbly well. But in previous incumbents, it's not always been the case. And you, you, it's difficult to find. And I think this city is a city of realists. I don't think we're dreamers. I think we're real. And I think we pride ourselves on being real. And the feeling towards the manager is real from the fan base. And I think you've got to be careful when you, when, you, when you think about tampering with that. And I think people look at this in Nottingham for what it is. Nobody can turn around and say, but you don't know what it feels like when it's crap. Yeah, we do. Because we've been in League One not that long ago. Everybody can remember what Yeovil felt like. Everybody can remember what it felt like to get knocked out of a cup by Macclesfield. Woke in knock him out as well. Yeah, Chester, yeah. Chester, I mean, come on. People have been there. We're in the Premier League now. Come on. I mean, people get it for what it is. The, va the vast majority of Forest fans get it for what it is. And, and, the, and the commitment he has and the job that he's done, in the eyes of the Forest supporters, means a lot. And it, you, he's got to be given time. He can't click his fingers and get it right. He's not going to turn up against Villa next week. And, and he's got it all worked out. It won't happen. But if there's a belief in the room that he can get it right, then you've got to allow him to do that because you know the man that you're dealing with. You don't know the man that you're dealing with if you make the change. You've got to find that out. And it might bite you on the backside if, if that individual is not quite as committed as this one. And then you start the process all over again. And we all know as Forest supporters, when you get the wrong one, how bad it is because we've been there. We've been there mm. together. Mm. Yeah, you'd be asking the new managers to do what Steve Cooper did 12 months ago, and you can't keep doing that, it is a big concern of mine. And the other point I'd like to make... No, I mean, listen, let's, let's not forget the days of Gary Megson and people like that. I mean, come on. Everybody at that stage would have given their right arm to be bottom of the league in the Premier League and lost five on the sprint. Everybody. Everybody. This time last year, everybody would have given their right arm to be bottom of the league having lost five on the sprint in the Premier League. Because they were heading to League One at that point. So people need a bit of reality. And I don't think that if, if there's a serious question within the room about the recruitment from the owner, that I don't think that's the manager's fault. And I don't think that's a reason to sack the manager. I think if anything, if the owner sat down with his advisors, his team, and looked at it, and the decision that he's come up with is, I'm not sure about the chief exec. I'm not sure about the head of recruitment. And I'm not sure about the chief scout. In my view, logically, that should give your manager more time because you can make then a reason in your own mind as to why it's been difficult. I think there's, there's two things I want to say before we go. Firstly, I mean, without Steve Cooper, it might have been Forrest playing Mansfield last night, not Derby. And I'd yeah. like to remember that. And secondly... When, the, when they play Villa on Monday, if Steve Cooper's still in charge, then the atmosphere and the fans will have a part to play. And I think it will be rocking. And I do think that can make a difference. Because I don't know how much you've seen of Villa. Have you commentated on them? I've, you, obviously, I thought they were really good against Man City. But I've seen them in other games and I've, I've not been impressed. And I think it is a game, touch wood, that they can win. And then they're on seven points and they might, they're probably off the bottom. And it, it can change things. We're not, we're not adrift. It's been a bad three weeks. But I feel like we're on a bit of a knife edge where it could go either way. 
And we but feel I also think as well, Matt, if, hope. I, th I think as well, Matt, if you, if you make a decision that's popular with the supporters, it can actually be a, a positive effect. And I think if you internally realise what your problem is, you've taken a big step towards solving it. I think the biggest problem at football clubs is when they don't know what the problem is. And then they start making random decisions to try and solve what? Because they've not worked out what they're solving. But they're making random decisions. But in actual fact, they're not solving anything because they don't know what the issue is. If they've identified the reason why they think they're in the mess they're in at the moment, then you, you, you've you taken a step towards solving it, haven't you? So mm. if, if, that's, if what we, we hear yesterday is right, then Forest supporters can sit back and say, well, look, they're taking a long, hard look at what the situation looks like, what they've got right, what they've got wrong. They're going to take decisive action based on that. And then it's almost a case of, right, we know what we did wrong. You can try and put some of that right in January if that's what you want to do. But in the meantime, we're going to carry on with this process that we know can work for us because we saw it happen last season. And we're going to, we're going to wait and be patient until it comes right. And there, there are still plenty of games to stay in the Premier League. Newcastle didn't win until December last season. Finished 11th. So it, it can be done. Um, probably last question before we go. I mean, if you look at the Premier League as a whole, does it feel like it's a quite a pivotal time at the bottom? You've got Ralph Haas and Hoot all under pressure. If Forrest were to beat Villa, then Stephen Gerrard's definitely under pressure. Leicester aren't out of the woods. Wolves have got a new manager in there at the game after for Forrest. It's quite a tumultuous time. The Forrest could come out of this OK. I just feel like they need to hold their nerve and just back the manager a little bit. It looks to me, Matt, the Premier League at the minute, there's five or six clubs that you can kind of count on and then everybody else is almost in a period of flux from week to week. Yeah. I don't, yeah. Think, I don't, I don't think there are many teams outside the obvious ones who would sit down and go, we're satisfied. I think a lot of them are up and down at the moment, aren't they? And I think that's going to be the story of the season. And we don't know again how this World Cup break is going to affect everybody. Some teams are going to come back better for it. Some teams are going to come back really stretched. If you've got the entire squad away at the World Cup, I'm sure that's going to impact you at some stage of the season in terms mm -hmm. of injuries, tiredness, just general fatigue, particularly if you're playing in cup competitions, Champions League, FA Cup, trying to win a league title. If you're one of those clubs, it has to hit you at some stage, surely, Yeah, I, I would there's, suspect. Well, there's even things like if you're two weeks away from the World Cup and you're a player who might be on the plane, you're going to go even harder. But if you're a player right. who nails be on the plane, you right. think, oh, I might not go in for that 50-50 because I might get right. injured. It's, right. it's, it's a weird season, isn't it? It's a weird, weird season. And, and, I, and I think all of this has to be on the table when these discussions are had. Um, and I think it goes back again. You know, this is kind of, I don't think a supporter really cares if they fire the recruitment team. I don't think anybody cares. Do they? Really? Oh, I disagree. I think they I do. I, th I think I the message it sends would anger supporters. What I mean is, I don't think they know who they are, really. It's not like a manager. You can get rid of a recruitment team and then you'll get a little press release that says so-and-so's coming in. Nobody really has an opinion until you see a transfer window. Would, Manage you, change that, would you change that opinion for Dane Murphy, though? Because I think people do know who Dane Murphy is and what he did. You still no, think not, people not really. care. Forrest, Forrest aren't going to stay in the Premier League because of Dane Murphy. Forrest are going to stay in the Premier League because of Steve Cooper and the players. Simple. I agree about that, but I do disagree that the mood around the club would dam be damaged massively if Cooper goes, and then we don't know how it goes after that. I do think the sacking of Dane Murphy would have a short-term punch in the gut for fans. But why? I do think one win, would, one win would erase that, but I do think fans would be a bit narcs if you got do rid of Dane Murphy. Do you? I do, I do. I just think he's he was the one who bought Cooper in. And I think, I, I think it's a short-term thing, and everything comes down to results, like you say. If Forrest win two games... No one cares if Dave Murphy's sacked or not. But I just think in that immediate moment, fans would be narked. That's just what, how I would read it. Do you think the atmosphere would be any different on Monday night if they sacked the recruitment team? Or do you think the, the atmosphere would be different on Monday night if they got rid of Steve Cooper? I don't think it'd impact the crowd on the night. No, 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 I don't think it would. No, no, I don't think it would. It. People might discuss it in the pub over a pint, the whys and wherefores. But I think in general it would be washed over by the time the team walk out against Aston Villa. But I think if Rafa Benitez is stood on the touchline when Forrest walk out against Aston Villa, you'd really feel it. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. I think I mean around 
the bond and the feel of the club and the direction uh, and that kind of overall strategy of where the club is and what it's what the club is and where it's going. I think people would be annoyed if Dane Murphy went, but not in the stands because when the teams walk out, no, it wouldn't have any impact on that at all. People are going to be. Let me just say, I have no opinion. I, I have no opinion because I don't know him. So I don't know whether he, I don't know whether he's good at his job or not. I don't know. I, I'd like to think they could get through this and nobody loses their job. You don't ever want to see anybody get sacked. We all sit here as football fans, and it's like a natural thing that somebody gets fired. But if that's one of your mates at work, you don't want to see him get fired. You never want to see anybody get sacked. You'd like mm. to think that they can work this out between them and come out the other side and be good. And, and that, this goes back to the entire thing about the manager situation, which is what everybody's talking about right now. And that is, unless he's become a worse manager than he was at the start of the season and when he was still there holding the trophy up at Wembley, why would you get rid of him? Because the entire skill set that he has is the skill set that you're going to be looking for when you replace him. What I would say, though, and he'd be the first to tell you this, it can only carry on for so long. There is a cut-off point in this sport where any owner would say, I've got to do something different. Because everybody says the right thing before you kick a ball. Oh, well, let's get through the whole season. The right thing to do is that if we get relegated, Steve takes charge of the first game in the championship, we come straight back. I still think a lot of fans believe that and would like to see that. But I think that changes for an owner at certain stages, particularly one that's put as much of his own money into the football club as, as Evangelos Maranakis has. He can never be criticised for, for backing the team. And people need to remember as well that when they were a championship club, the amount of money that he put in on a monthly basis to keep the whole thing going can never be forgotten about either. Because heaven knows where the club would be now had it not have been for that commitment, which is a big commitment. It's all right looking at somebody and saying, well, he's got stacks of cash. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't he want to bankroll Forrest? Well, have a look at it yourself. There's your bank account. And every week you've got to give <laughs> X amount of pounds to something that you don't think is being run the right way. At some stage, you're going to go, oh, hang on a second. Let's just, let's just sit. I mean, that, that's just life. That's just mm -hmm. life. But I don't think Steve's become a worse manager. I've still got confidence that he can put it right. I think the right thing for them to do, in my opinion, is to, is to roll with it and let him have the time he needs to work it out. And I think by doing that, by sitting him down and saying to him, look, we're going to stick with you. We're behind you. It's your team. We know you're the right person for it. You'll get another 20% out of a bloke that's given you 120% already in a mad way. You'll get even more out of him. So, and by the way, people talk about this togetherness in the changing room and all that. You can put a line through that in a minute because they don't know anybody. Nobody knows anybody. Mm. They all get to know each other. So the, the fact they've got any kind of spirit at the minute is testament to the manager, the staff and the players that they've been able to do that with so many new faces in there, because that's not a given. A lot of dressing rooms in, in football are are not that together, but it still works somehow. But this this group are together. You speak to the players, time for each other. So that bit's gone well. It, it's just a case of working it out. They've got to work out what the right team is, what the right 11 is, what changes he makes then to impact that 11, who's a square peg in a round hole, what the round pegs in the round holes are. And once they work that out, you can look at the squad and say, there's probably enough talent there to be okay. Mm. Mm. I agree. I agree. I was reading the comments about my Dane Murphy comment. Very 50-50 reaction. I was thinking about it while you were talking. Actually, if I was a fan walking to the city ground when I used to go regularly, before I was in journalism, I probably wouldn't have cared. No. I probably wouldn't have cared about Dane Murphy or Mark Arthur. If or I said like to you, give me, give, tell me the last five chief execs of the club. Uh, Dane, Vrensos, Mark Arthur. Can't tell you. Yeah, Very true. I'm I think I'm in a media bubble, aren't I? I yeah, think the other point I'm making though, Matt, fans have a personal connection to the players and the manager. Mm. And then everybody else is peripheral to a large extent, aren't they? And I, I you know, I, I, I get the point that because Dane takes the, the credit for, for being the guy that appointed Steve, that matters because that was a big decision, mm. huge decision. So I get that. But I also think that it's a different reaction from a fan base if a manager gets sacked or a player gets sold than if a recruitment person or a member of the board leaves the club. It's just a different mindset. It's just different. Mm. True.
who's appointing the next manager then if Cooper goes? If there's no faith in Dane Murphy, we don't know there isn't. That's an interesting question as well, isn't well, it? I, I think you could probably answer it without... I don't think you need me to tell you that, do you? I mean, I, I, think, I, don't, think, I don't think that's a difficult one to answer, is it? Unless it's the, the owner, isn't it? Checking, but I, I would think that there will be people with opinions in there that, that will need to be listened to. Yeah. Rightly or wrongly. True. Right, we should leave it there. I think that was an interesting discussion. Hopefully people enjoyed it. We went a bit longer than I thought we would, but there's obviously a lot to get through and lots of interesting points made by Fletch. Uh, thanks to everyone who watched along with lots of comments. We might come back later in the week and talk more about the Villa game, but we shall see. Might have done that to death already. Uh, yeah, Fletch, thank you very much. Thank you, mate. Enjoy Chelsea. Good food there. <laughs> Be a good game as well. Hopefully. <laughs> says more about me that I was thinking about the press food than the actual game but there you go right thanks very much everyone and we shall see you soon <laughs>